Oh boy, hello, uh, this is Quintus Hazard once again, and we are going to make our second friend in PestaQuest, who is going to be Rose Lalonde, something beyond the sky. On the advice of your new friend, John. Oh, we have to, um, this is like uh, one of these playing in orders kind of things. Okay, so we have to play it in order, otherwise you get spoilers from the last route. On the advice of your new friend, John, you go to visit one of his close comrades. Close only figuratively speaking, since it seems like she lives all the way on the other side of the country. That's no problem for you, though, since your new powers let you hop anywhere, anytime, even to places that don't exist. Well, you think your powers let you do that. You just have this distinct metatextual feeling that you could just pretty much go anywhere at this point. You know that doesn't make any sense. There's nothing that doesn't make sense about friendship, though, and that's exactly what you're about to do. Friendship, that is. You're about to do some friendship by making a new friend. Her name is... you check your nose. Rose. This is her house, apparently. It looks kind of weird and modern, and it's situated in the middle of the woods for no good reason you can think of. Also, it's pouring rain, which is not what you would describe as ideal friend-making conditions. Still, nothing stops a mailman, not from delivering mail while making friends. Rather famously, rain and other similar weather patterns provide no deterrent to the performance of his duty. There is no duty more important than friendship. Suddenly, a woodland girl approaches. Who goes there? Oh, it's your new friend Rose, obviously. There is literally no one else this could be. You introduce yourself. You are the cool mailman who John told her would ex to expect a visit from soon. You would doff your mail hat to signal a friendly greeting, except recently you accidentally dropped it into a sewer along with all your other mail-specific clothes, as well as all the mail you were supposed to deliver, as you explained to her gratuitously in an unconvincing manner. It's not a great start, you admit, but you've done much worse. You are not a mailman. Yikes, you're busted almost immediately. You briefly consider whether you should double down on the lie try and try to say something mailman-like, or whether the right call is to come clean since she's clearly too smart for this amateur bullshit. But it's taking a few seconds too long for you to decide, which looks guilty as hell. That's it, the jig is up, you slouch in defeat. You ask her if she could, she would... Oh, this is good music. Please consider not telling John. Your heart couldn't take it if you found out your entire friendship was based on a lie. You want me to keep a secret from one of my best friends to pre protect the feelings of a random buffoon who I've never met and arbitrarily showed up to my house in the remote wilderness like a creep? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, that's what you want. It's an interesting proposition, if for no other reason than its audacity. I admire your resolve in the face of humiliation. This doesn't mean we're friends, though. Oof, rough. Well, that's fine. You're hopeful. Your mind is fuzzy, but you think you remember this. You're good at this. You are excellent at making people like you through underhanded means. You can't wait to take advantage of this 13-year-old girl's goodwill. Oof, that sounds creepy. Okay, well, not like that. Let's not be fucking weird. In fact, like that would be the last creepy joke you have for comical purposes. S-grade jokes only. Let's all get our brains out of the gutter. Rose raises a thin brow. There's something unsettling about her deep violet eyes. You're pretty sure most humans don't have eyes like that, but what the fuck do you know? You're a stranger around these parts. Wait, aren't you a human too? Whatever, it's not a big deal. Not when there are friends to be made. Or something. Do you want to come inside? Unless I'm interrupting your internal monologue, of course. Far be it from me to ever cut short any sort of navel-gazing sidebar. It's just ever so slightly wet out here. Dogs! My dog. Buddy! You would definitely love that. If it's not too much trouble, of course, you wouldn't want to put Rose out. You're lying, though. You are 100% fine with it being absolutely infuriatingly obnoxious if it means making a friend. My dog is barking just like I want. Please stop. Rose purses her lips, considering. Your predilections towards mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had certain powers. Powers of teleportation and time travel. I told him that he must be mistaken, since it's a well-known and accepted fact that magic, although a popular and highly engaging subject of fiction, is fake as hell. Oh, your zappy powers? No, those are totally real and not fake. Real in a different way than you being a mailman is real, since that is actually made up. Is that so? Prove it. You shrug. Easy enough. You hold out a hand, and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers in yours. Her nails are long and sharp and painted a glossy black. She closes her eyes and her umbrella droops. Should I pitch in my room or something similar? I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work. She still thinks she'll fucking with her. You tell her you guess she can do that if she wants. 
You sat the two of you inside the big modern house. When you open your eyes, you find yourself in a large, messy bedroom. Oh. She drops her umbrella. You... You really did that? Rose stands in the centre of her room in full rain gear. Her boots track muddy prints into the thick white carpet. Surprise! You really are magic. Rose puts a small hand against her perfectly painted black lips. She seems momentarily lost for words, and you get the feeling that this is not a thing that happens very often. Her eyes are wide and deeply purple. They're sparkling, you might even say. Hold on, I'll be right back. Stay here, don't go out into the hall. It's not... it's not safe. You tell Rose to take her time, and you're happy to just stand here dripping onto her nice clean floor. She leaves the room and you take the opportunity to examine your surroundings a little more closely. The bed is unmade, books are strewn over the floor carelessly, and a collection of half-drunk cups of coffee crowd the desk. Half-finished knitting projects lie in soft piles all over the room. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that this room is often occupied by someone with a lot of interest, who has trouble settling down and putting her attention to one thing at a time. Man, you were late. Not with interest, but with friends. You can't imagine settling for just one. Rose has a number of posters on her walls, although nowhere near as many as your friend John. A car in the hangers beside the window, days ticked off with little X's, all the way up to 413, which is circled. You step closer to read the year date up in the corner. 2009. What the hell do you care about the date? You can make friends any day of the damn week, rain or shine, night or day. Rose sure is taking a while out there. She told you that it wasn't safe out in the hall. Maybe she hadn't just been quipping. Maybe she's actually in trouble. What should you do? Uh, stay put. Your patience pays off almost at once. Rose is back and looking significantly more put together. Also, she's brought you a towel. Here. I'm not overly really attached to anything in here. It's mostly just childish nonsense I haven't yet bothered to rid myself of. But I'd appreciate it if you tried not to drip on any of the notebooks. She has changed out of her raincoat and boots, which is dressed in a neat black skirt with a white shirt with a purple blob thing with tentacles. What is it with these kids and their blob shirts? Now that's dealt with. Please sit down. She crosses her legs. You suddenly feel like you're at a job interview, friend interview. You wish you were a little less damp. Actually, let's switch places. Uh, this is still pretty wet and you don't want to get a bedspread messed up. Don't worry about it, that's what washing machines are for. Now, let's talk about magic. Which up until now I've always taken for granted as being something confined to storybooks. Rose takes a wistful look towards her bedroom window, greyed over and blurry with raindrops. You get the feeling that she's doing it for effect. Maybe that's why she wanted you to switch places with her. And then comes you, the not a mailman with a penchant for showing up and attempting to make friends with unwitting children. Well, fair, she's got you there, but honestly she... Um, she might be a child, but she really doesn't seem to be unwitting. On the contrary, she's really quite witting. Witty. I'm glad you noticed. She folds her hands and clears her throat. You think that if she had any notes, she would be shuffling them. And so, the question remains, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Or are you a wizard? We've already established that you are not a public servant. Is there a difference between a witch and a wizard? Of course there is, but exactly how specific of a difference can vary. According to some works of fiction, a wizard is just a witch's male counterpart. But in certain mythologies, for instance Arthurian legend, the difference appears to be class-based. Wizards reside at court and are classically trained, while witches are self-taught and run wild through the forest. I won't deny that those differences tend to often be gendered as well. You ask her which one she is, a witch or a wizard? Me? Rose shifts, uncrossing and recrossing her legs. You shrug and say she just seems to know a lot about them. I know a thing or two, but can I tell you a secret? Oh my god, Rose, she has no idea how much you would love to hear her secret. I find them wizards, I mean. Utterly reprehensible. They disgust me, everything from their floppish robes to their grizzled beards. It's my mother who is the wizard enthusiast in this house. Although... She glances from side to side, theatrically. Most of the things Rose does seems to be at least a little bit theatrical. She kneels on the carpet beside the cluster of books. I don't show these to many people. Actually, I haven't shown them to anyone. Not even John. John seems to be a pretty cool guy. Definitely a guy worth sharing a few secret notebooks with. Rose laughs. No, I haven't shown them to John, and I've only shown Strider to punish him. You nod, pretending you know who the Strider person is. You are a totally normal dude with an un absolutely ungodly number of friends. A shadow moves through the centre of you. A trembling moment of deja vu. You, you do have a lot of friends, don't you?
I thought it was true. The only people you know here are John and now Rose. Weird. You try to put it to um you try to put it to from your mind and listen to Rose again. She is still talking about this mysterious strider, flipping through one of the journals, too quickly for you to see anything specific, only that it is full from cover to cover. As if my modest writings are the sole source of homoerotic tension in his life, when his brother is the one who insists on filling the home with a sort of dick butt for ironic purposes. Rose rolls her eyes. Oh boy, you missed the beginning of that. It probably made way more sense than it seemed like. Rose is searching through her notebooks, checking markings on the spine. It seems to be some sort of cataloging system of arcane symbols. Where is... Oh right. She does, another, um, she does something quick and complex with her fingers, and another notebook pops into existence and falls into her lap. You gape, she really is a wizard. What? It's just a Cyrodex. Child could use one. Here. This notebook has a couple of drawings in it, but most of it is filled with small, neat handwriting and lathered ink. Is Rose writing a book? No, don't be silly. I'm writing four books at least. Five, depending on whether or not I decide to flesh out Carmesis' backstory. It isn't strictly necessary, but it does add a certain amount of valuable character insight, which renders their actions in the later volumes more sympathetic. Not that I need to, um, all of my anti-heroes to be sympathetic. I'm just thinking of what the literary reviewers would say. You nod. Smart. You never would have thought of what the literary reviewers would say. She's honestly pretty impressive for someone her age. Age has nothing to do with it. But don't get carried away. It's only a rough draft. You ask her if you can take a look. She hesitates, but you doubt she would have shown it to you if she didn't want you to look. What the hell? If you can't trust a strange spherical imprint you met outside in the rain, who can you trust? Right? Your thoughts exactly. Rose hands you the notebook and you open it at random, letting fate guide your hands. Friglish bothered his beard, as if from kinking a hitch in a long silk windsock. A more pedestrian audience would pass the exhibit as nervous compulsion, behaviour to petition contempt along the reasonable. He was, however, not surrounded by the reasonable, but the wise, a distinction in men that would forever be the difference in history's garland of treasured follies. As a matter of fact, his cater of fellow wizards were all putting, put, putting similar moves on their beards as well. The practice would evince thoughtfulness, sagacity even, if they didn't do it all the time. Standing in line at the bank, shooting squirrels from bird feeders, few occasions were safe. Zazapad inspected the clue, a single piece of evidence cradled in his cr uh, coriaceous old man palms. It was a human bone, not striking in the tale it told alone so much as that told by the thousands like it, festooning the marshy soil of the mass grave. The grisly expanse bore the texture of a decadent dessert, like one of Smiley's formidable custard trifles wobbled out on wheels for the holidays, the, to the dismay of a small nation. You're certain of this? asked Friglish. Despite what he was doing with his beard, he was in fact immersed in meaningful contemplation. I am afraid I am becoming more so with each terrible tick groused by that gaudy timepiece slid around your neck. In case it wasn't clear, Friglish wore a clock Zazapan didn't care for. It was magic. The massacre of Sirs Gnalf was not as written. Wow, this is pretty dense, but smart. You stroke your own imaginary beard and return to pond with a deeper meaning. Mm, yes, intriguing. Zazapan and Friglish. Clearly there is some history there. Yes, clearly. But what the, um, the two of them shared went beyond simple romance. That's why it has gone so spectacularly sour. Rose becomes increasingly more animated as she tells you about her gay wizard OCs. <laughs> like she's far more interested in them than she is in herself. They share an intellectual bond, a mutual dedication to knowledge and the preservation of such. The goal of the learned is to amass their wisdom and keep it from general dissemination to the main populace of wizards. They feed it to their apprentices in drips and drabs. Of course, this will eventually lead to ruin. Of course. You flip further in the book, searching for the part where it leads to ruin. Ruin sounds interesting. Zazapan knew he would see his wayward apprentice again, near like he knew the tide would turn and the sun would blaze to its zenith as each inexorable day passed. Now they stood diametrically opposed across an overgrown chessboard. His apprentice's eyes were hidden behind dark glasses, but Zazapan knew that if he could see them, they would be riddled with the madness of the void. Carmesis wasn't here for justice or for revenge. They were here exclusively because Zazapan had something they wanted, something they were owed. Oh, it's Carmesis non-binary.
You flip through the notebook, checking out the drawings. There are a lot of wizards, each more bearded and venerable than the last. One of the pictures, the most recent maybe since it's on the very last page of the journal, is of um, two young wizards, twins maybe. They have grey hair and are wearing slick green suits and are standing back to the back with their arms entwined, staring into the middle distance. It's very anime. You compliment Rose on her artistic prowess. Yes, thank you. They're all right. I'm a much better writer than I am an artist. You tell me you think she's really good. Way better than you. You're absolutely positive she's going to be famous one day. I appreciate the encouragement, even though I know you're just primed to flatter me, due to your strange thirst for affirmative experiences. John told me all about that. Damn, busted. But you really do think she's talented. It's fine. It's not as if my social calendar is over full out here in the middle of the woods. I don't tell anyone I said that I don't have many f friends. I don't tell them that I've been drawing. He'd be insufferable. He? Never mind. He. Is this Doc Scratch? Um, or Dave, or John. You sure Rose that her secrets are safe and hand back her journal. You really are excited about your new friend, as if you might be so bold, and her wizard stories. Although, wait. Hadn't you said that she hated wizards? What's your point? Well, you're no expert on wizards or on Rose, but it seems like she actually does seem to like them, because she has several notebooks full of wizard fiction. You're not trying to get, like, real here, but maybe it's, it's possible her mum isn't the only one in the family who likes wizards? Rose pulls her book out of your hands. That and the rest of the books vanish into thin air. Oh, right, that must be have been that, what you called it, Silodex? She doesn't look angry exactly, but the lines around her mouth and eyes that soften as she talked about her book have hardened back up. Her eyes glitter menacingly. Oh, is that right, Freud? Well, why don't you diagnose me? Oh, hey, wow, well, you weren't trying to be condescending or whatever. Clearly. Were you aware that it's a common psychological phenomenon for an individual to react to trauma by creating fictional representations of that which has caused the bodily harm or emotional dismay? To suggest that the portrayal of these fictional renderings somehow condones them or supports them is absolutely absurd. So what she's saying is, is that she draws wizards to cope. Rose rises regally to her feet, the lightning turns her into an ethereal silhouette. What I'm saying is that I don't need to justify my fictional predilections to you or to anyone else. No, no, she's totally right. You're sorry that you suggested she might like wizards. It was horribly presumptuous, and not at all the way a friend should act. You are so, so sorry. You promise it will never happen again. No, I don't suppose it will. It's probably just because Rose's hair is such a pale blonde, but it almost looks like she's glowing in the dim bedroom, like light behaves a little differently around her than it does in everything else. But you look at that. It appears the rain has lightened up a bit. The rain is hitting the window so loudly you're actually having trouble hearing her. And your point is? You can just zap yourself out to where the weather is drier. Fuck off. <laughs> we should try and get the good ending and then the instant bad ending. Let's go look for her. You were too anxious to sit still, and you aren't the sort of person who just sits there and waits for friend opportunities to fall into their lap. Better to run headlong into danger, or as much danger as a minimalist upper middle class house in the middle of the woods can offer. Rose has told you that it isn't safe. You creep out into the hallway, where a bunch of things happen more or less simultaneously, a deluge of quick time events that you had no idea were coming. Lightning flashes in a perfect jagged line across the tall window at the end of the hall, followed immediately by a crash of thunder so loud you think the house might be falling down. Abruptly, all the lights go out. Another flash of lightning, and for a ver... Verti... 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 Gin... Vertiginous moment you see a long thin figure superimposed against the window. You freak the fuck out, jumping about a foot in the air and yelling like a cat. A small hand lands on your shoulder and you jump again. Calm down, it's just me. Rose speaks in a normal tone of voice and it's jarring. The house is echoing, cavernous, and there's just something about a dark house on a stormy evening that makes you want to whisper. I told you to stay put for a reason. It's too early for my mother to be sourced enough not to notice random strangers in the house, and I don't want to go through the tedious process of explaining who you are. You have a perfectly understandable reason for why you left, and that reason is that you were lonely. Rose snorts. Cold! You meant you were cold. Wow, you are soaking wet. Follow me. 
She grabs you by the wrist and tows you down the hall. You wonder if you should warn her about the strange wraith-like creature you saw by the window, but you don't want to freak her out. Although her mum might be at risk too. Whatever, mums are tough. She'll be fine. This probably isn't the um, first time she's gone toe to toe with a weird slender man. This house looks haunted as shit. Rose brings you to a dark laundry room, then motions you to take off your hoodie, which you do gladly because it is soaking wet. That's interesting. Hmm? The design on the front, does it mean anything? Oh, yeah, it is kind of cool. A blue line that zigzags on one end like lightning. Looking at it makes you feel unsettled. Your eyes, Rose, is still waiting for a response, so you just hand her the hoodie and tell her that no, you're pretty sure it's just an abstract sign. Then you stand there while she tosses the sweatshirt in the dryer, feeling the alarming currents of memory in your bloodstream. You're sure there must be something you forgot to do. You continue to feel weird as Rose hits the dryer button and nothing happens. Fuck. She hits the button a few more times, as if that will make a bit of difference when the power is out. She presses her thumb and forefinger to the bridge of her nose. Well, you aren't going to fit into anything of mine. She leads you down more long dark hallways. Man, this house is unreasonably huge. It has groups of a lot of people live here. No, it's just me and my mother and a horde of liquids not soluble in water. Here, try not to drip on the carpet. You're not sure how you're supposed to manage that, but okay. The room at this room is large and dark, and when Rose parts the curtains, a flash of lightning illuminates a four-poster bed, a long counter, and a shelf covered head to toe in bottles. Rose hashes through another doll, leaving you to peruse. This is, yeah, this is all liquor. Shit, this is a lot of booze. Here, I'm not sure what you would want to wear, but this should work until the power comes back on and we can dry your clothes. Rose hands you a long silk robe. She won't miss this. I don't think she's ever even worn it. She has this whole closet full of fantastic clothes that she never puts on. You take the robe and go into the large master bathroom. It's kind of a mess. The tub looks like it hasn't been cleaned in a long time. Oh, we're getting a robe and we're going to bathrooms. This is like reminiscent of Tagora's route. The robe gives you the same knotted feeling of familiarity that you're that looking at your hoodie did. But you put it on anyway. It's a relief to get out of your wet clothes. You hang them carefully on the shower rod. Um, when you head back out into the bedroom, you find Rose standing in front of, a bot um, of the wall of liquor. She's holding a bottle of Grey Goose and squinting at the label like she's trying to read the nutrition facts. I've often wondered what exactly the merits of consuming this are. It tastes quite literally like burning. She opens the bottle and before you can protest that she is in by no means the legal drinking age in wherever the fuck you are, she pulls the bottle to her mouth and takes a sip. She sputters. Blech. That's terrible! You could have told her that. Straight vodka isn't for the uninitiated, even fancy vodka. You take the bottle from her. She hesitates for a moment, then lets it go. You set it back on the shelf. This really is uh, quite an impressive liquor cabinet. Liquor wall, liquor room. Her mum must have a refined palate. Don't strain yourself. You can say it. What's the point of mincing words? She's a fucking alcoholic. Wow, this is intense. You're not sure if you're prepared for something this heavy. You're kind of counting on some silly shenanigans. Maybe a couple of funny jokes. You aren't cut out for this. You get the feeling that at some point you might have been cut out for this. You might have been the sort of person your friends, or potential friends, could count on. In fact, you know on some level that this is true, but whenever you try to nail down any sort of specifics, you find a gaping lacuna in your experiences? It's all just white noise. Rosie's shoulders slump as she stands surveying her mother's bottles. She doesn't even have the decency to hide her distasteful habits. Who needs an entire wall of liquor bottles? She doesn't have people over. She doesn't have any friends. This is all just for me, just more of her passive aggressive act as a femme fatale 1950s housewife with a death, death wish? It's just like the wizards. Wizards? Don't worry about it. You know how I've always been since I've had a home-cooked meal? And I'm not saying that I require or even deserve a lovingly crafted culinary masterpiece every time I sit down to eat. That's going a bit far. I know John complains about being plagued by fatally concern every chance he gets. He is overwhelmed by pastry so whenever he ventures from his room. I'm glad my mother doesn't poke her considerable nose into my private affairs. But I'm sick of eating oatmeal. Rose. I told you, don't worry about it. But you will worry about it. You worry about all your friends. All two of them. Rose smiles with half her mouth. It seems to be about all she can manage. 
Lightning crashes. She looks so small and sad against this wall of bottles. You know how to fix this. Thunder rolls and you clench your fist. A friendship clench! You don't know who you are, you don't know why you're here, but you do know that surely you have these powers for a reason. And what better reason than helping this poor, poor young girl with her troubled home life? Rolling up your floppy sleeves, you get to work. What are you doing? You start with the dark liquors first. In your experience, those cause worst... Those cause worse hangovers and are more likely con to contribute to the absence of hot, motherly meals and the overconsumption of oatmeal. You grab two bottles of rum and one of bourbon, which you took in one armpit. Then you zap out of the house into a clearing in the nearby woods a couple of hours ago before it started raining. You drop the bottles and go back for more. Are you just stealing all of my mother's liquor? Is this your solution to her alcoholism? Don't worry, Rose can thank you later. I know I'm not reacting very much, but I, I really like this. I do. It's like, it's very long and there's like some callbacks and stuff. Like uh, with the bathrobe and the uh, bathroom, it's like a callback to Tagore's route. And with all the liquor and stuff, it's like a callback to Chixie's route. You go for the tequila next, then the vodka, then you get sick of this organised approach and just start grabbing whatever the fuck and dumping it in the past. Rose watches you do this for a while, then she hops up on the counter, crosses her legs and starts texting. Wow, she's really so intent on her conversation that she isn't noticing you're fixing her domestic situation. She keeps giving you little fleeting looks and you're pretty sure she must be talking about you. You should just let her talk. It isn't right to try to invade your friend's privacy. You attempt to, you attempt to resist the temptation, which you fail at immediately. Not even an overused meme can save you. You sat behind her onto the counter where you can spy on her private correspondence. I don't know anything about them, I'm sorry. Oh, and it was me trying to make advantage of her uncannity ability- uncannity I can't speak! Uncannity ability to make guesses verging on prognostication. I'm recently considering a re-evaluation on magic. Hmm, you don't know who this person is. Maybe you should just... Go back in time a couple of minutes ago to when Rose started her conversation. Your past self is busily zapping back and forth carrying liquor bottles. You, bunker, you hunker down so you don't see yourself and cause a paradox or whatever the fuck. Tentacle therapist began pestering the agnostic. Out of a moment of curiosity to shine a light on my future, I come with metaphorical hat in hand to ask you to consult your dream clouds. Do you happen to know anything about a strange cardboard cutout creature masquerading as a mailman? Are you sleeping? Sorry, I had to scold back. He's been acting really weird all of a sudden. Anyway, is this the same mailman that John was talking about? The fake one who went out with him? That's the one. They are currently emptying my mother's liquor cabinet in an attempt to prevent her from overindulging herself. Oh, are they drinking it? No, I think they're just dropping it into the woods with their magic powers. Oh, hmm. Do you know um, that she could just go out and buy more liquor? That's something you can do when you, where you live, right? Yes, well, not exactly where we live. I think the nearest boozery is a good 20 minute drive. I'm not actually entirely sure when my mother got it all. We don't own a car, as far as I know. Something it, sometimes it seems like she has the ability to just make things appear. I don't know anything about them, I'm sorry. Oh, this is like referencing Roxy's void powers. And he was being trying to take advantage of your kind of. I'm still pretty sure magic is fake, at least the kinds of magic you're talking about. They're probably. There's probably some real magic out there somewhere. Yes, for instance, the sort that lets you spy on your hostess's private correspondence while you are stealing her mother's li libations. You freeze. With a contrite zap, you reappear in front of Rose. She sets her phone down and props her chin up on a delicate fist. Sorry, you honestly don't know what got into you. You just couldn't resist using your power for evil. Haven't you heard that with great power comes great responsibility? Rose is right. She's totally right. You only had this power for like a day, so you still aren't used to the idea of being able to just zap all over the narrative. Clearly you did not appreciate the implications. Zapping all over the narrative sounds potentially stressful. Oh, you bet. You're incredibly stressed right now. Rose laughs. You apologise to her for stealing all her mum's drinks. That was kind of overzealous of you. No, actually, I thought it was hilarious. I've never really been one for pranks. There's always four more in John's wheelhouse, but there's nothing wrong in occasionally stepping outside of one's comfort zone. Let's do the vodka next. The two of you are working together to get the place cleared out pretty quick. You zap Rose along with you to the bright clearing in the field, and for a moment she just stands in a sunbeam, blinking up at the cloudless sky. 
Her expression says she might, um, she still might not be totally convinced any of this is happening. When all the liquor has been transferred from the bedroom to the woods in a big glittering dragon's horde of booze, you and Rose fall down next to it in a messy heap. Well, you fall into a messy heap. Rose lowers herself daintily, sitting more on her knees than her butt, probably to keep her skirt from getting dirty. You get the idea that even though she lives in the middle of nowhere, she doesn't spend a ton of time outside. You tell her again that you're sorry you spied on her correspondence with her green friend, GG. Also, you hope she isn't going to get in trouble with her mum. I'm not unduly concerned. I'll tell her where it all is in a couple days, although by that time I'm sure at least a good third of it will be water damaged. I'm sure this will have fantastic implications for our relationship and not at all exacerbate the emotional problems underlying her addiction. You laugh awkwardly. Well, now you kind of just feel like an arsehole. Rose lies back on the grass and raises a hand to trace the curves of a fluffy white cloud. She closes her eyes. Perhaps it's just protection on my part or wishful thinking. But ever since I met you, I feel like something has changed. Or rather, something has failed to change, if that makes any sense. It's probably nothing. Her eyes flicker back open, endlessly purple, fixed on the sky like she can see something beyond it, and once again you feel that there's something really crucial that you forgot. But at least you've made a new friend, and even if you don't think Rose's brand, Rose's brand will ever allow her to call you as such, you're lying in a sunny clearing next to a pile of alcohol, and honestly, it doesn't get much friendlier than that. Oh, that's nice. Now we need to get the instant bad end. Uh, no. Man, yesterday is the day you're owned by teens. She is totally right. What are you doing just wandering up to her house without even calling first? It's just totally disrespectful of her time. No need to self-flagellate. It was a simple suggestion to more critically examine the motivations and actions in the future. No, no, she's right, you're going. You zap away, aiming for a spot half a mile away into the woods, where you can become properly soaked and miserable. But instead of trees, you find yourself standing in front of a bank of computers. Shit, you misfired. Wait, you remember seeing a big structure off in the distance when you were in front of Rosa's house? You figured it was just some sort of office building, but this mo looks more like a factory or a secret research lab. The computers show coordinates on a screen that doesn't mean anything to you. A countdown clock is frozen on 4.13. All of this has the trappings of a tableau someone set up for you to see. Turning away from the screens, you wander down a long line of gleaming science fiction equipment. It reminds you of pictures of old computers from the 1950s, the ones that took up entire rooms. You bet you could go back and visit some of those if you zapped hard enough. You wander through a whole maze of halls and wide, echoing rooms that aren't pictured because our art budget is only so big, but take as a certainty that they're all very mysterious. <laughs> I like that. Eventually, you circle back to the strange bank of screens. Nervously, you hit a few keys, tap a few fingers against the readouts. Nothing. It's all locked down. You think that if you could only get to these screens to unlock, you could unravel the secrets to life, the universe, and everything. Or maybe it's your memories you're trying to unlock. Maybe then you'll understand the seeming waters of the, the seminal ocean of time and space intertwining in the... Meow. Uh, meow. Meow. Oh shit. Uh, you turn around expecting a cat. And you do get a cat. A very adorable black kitten, tiny and soft with far more eyes than a cat should have. Oh, But the cat isn't the only thing here. Oh shit! A woman in a sleek white lab coat and sensible heels holds the cat, pinning you to the spot with her gaze. Or at least, you assume she is. Her hair is in her eyes, and the light is behind her, so all you can see of her face are her painted lips. Oh jeez! Most time! Uh, sorry ma'am, you absolutely didn't mean to trespass in her secret science lab, and you absolute, actually aren't even lying, you really did, did just fuck up this time. <laughs> no flowers. Mm. The lady pulls the cat down slowly where it rolls on its back and, pat and bats a paw playful in the air. Oh, cats are great. Even mutant cats. Maybe especially mutant cats. This old guy should have a name. Hmm, I think her name Cryptid McWhiskers. Yeah, Cryptid McWhiskers is a great name. In fact, you can't imagine anyone ever named this cat anything else. You uh, hold out a hand to Cryptid McWhiskers and wriggle your fingers. It rolls onto his back, uh, onto, back onto his feet and saunters over to you. It is as soft and fluffy as it looks, and its four eyes blink up at you with utter trust. At least this kitty will be your friend. 
The ominous clack of heels on cement reminds you that you and Cryptid Whiskers are not alone. While you're busy with the kitty cat, the very interrogating and well coiffed lady has walked over to the bank of screens. She presses a button and it must have some sort of fingerprint recognition or retinal scanning, or maybe she's just better at things than you are, because it works for her. On the floor a few feet from you is a round grey protrusion, a platform on the floor. You saw it earlier, but you had no idea what it was for, so you just ignored it. What, you, what you don't understand can't hit you, right? You, you think that's probably right. The intimidating lady presses a button on the screen, mouth turning up at the corners. A flash and a pop, like the pressure in the room changes. You feel it in your eardrums. A pumpkin appears on the round grey platform. Fuck. Hmm, you aren't really sure what she's trying to say here. Making a pumpkin appear out of thin air is impressive, but it probably would have been more so if you hadn't been popping in and out of existence all day. It's going to take more than a pumpkin to impress you. Pumpkin. What pumpkin? <laughs> oh jeez! The lady shakes her head and hits another button. The pumpkin vanishes and in its place is a tiger. Yes, you heard that right, a whole ass tiger. Orange and black, big teeth and big paws. For a second, the two of you just look at each other. Honestly, the tiger might be more shocked than you are. Kind of sucks to think about, one second you just chill on the savannah, mulling on slopes and drinking at the watering hole, and the next you're in a secret lab in upstate New York, staring down a very unappetizing looking protagonist. Apparently, you are appetizing enough for it to want to get a taste, though, because. <laughs> the auction views are cryptid and whisk gives them back again, and it charges. You try to book it out of there. The lady in the lab coat looms up in front of you. She's saying something. You strain to hear her. The tiger is right behind you. The lady or the tiger? At the last minute, you remember you have magic powers, and you choose the third option, teleporting the fuck out of there. Oh, not again. You just zapped into yet another unknown building. Although from the view out the window, you think it might be in Rose's house. Also the fact that Rose turns the corner in the hallway and stops short still in her rain gear. Her eyes are very wide. You wave awkwardly. That snaps her out of it. it. She stands up straight, sliding easily from shock to superiority. So you thought you'd just let yourself in. After wasting my time mumbling about the mail, a gaudy to play with manipulative self-recrimination, and then popping out of existence to leave me asking myself if I'd finally lost my mind? You aren't meant to do any of that, especially in the last part. She isn't losing her mind, unless both of you are losing your minds together. Rose looks you over. Finally, she seems to decide that you are for real. Your predilections towards male mimicry and all that John told me about. Oh? I also said there was a certain part. Oh, is this circling back around? Oh, powers of teleportation, time travel. I told him you must be mistaken. Uh, yeah, your zappy powers. Hey, doesn't she know that's bad luck? Luck is also fake as hell. You say you can do magic. Prove it. Okay. But she just saw you vanish out in the front yard. Like I said, I could be losing my mind. She could be losing it now at this very minute, but you see no point in arguing. You hold out a hand. Okay. Oh, is this... Where did that? Oh. Oh, it circles around, so there's only like one bad ending. Okay. That's cool. Uh, Blab is my, uh, aww. Yeah, looks like I did everything. So that's, uh, that's Pester Quest for one week, I guess. In two weeks, I'll be back with the next Pester Quest. Hooray! Goodbye.